Thanks to our sponsor, Dundeal.ie, we bring you Business Bites, the best bits of that great business show served up in bite-sized pieces. Dun Deal Motors is home to Ireland's largest range of new and premium used cars. That's why you'll find cars from Audi and BMW dealerships on Dun Deal. Are you looking for a seven-seater to accommodate your growing family? Maybe you're after a luxury saloon to make a statement. We have the car for you. You'll also find Ireland's largest range of electric cars to help you make the switch. Visit dundeal.ie today to start the search for your next car. From episode 142, John Larkin, creator of The Black Stuff, explains why he puts it under his arms and not in his mouth. That's great business show. Our first guest on this episode is an up-and-coming soap star. He may not be a household name just yet, but the name of his product is known across Ireland. John Larkin makes The Black Stuff, and it's a soap. So boom, boom. And of course, John may not always have wanted to make soap. He was a professional poker player for quite some time, but COVID and a family pushed him to star in soap. He started out on his own and now has five full-time employees, plus a handful of other helpers. So it could be the sweet smell of success, and that's enough puns just for now. John Larkin, founder of The Black Stuff, welcome to That Great Business Show. Thanks very much. Delighted to be here. Poker player becomes a soap star. Come on, you couldn't make it up. Yeah, I mean, I've never I've never followed a traditional trajectory when it comes to uh, employment, that's for sure. And you have a big marketing background. You also were kind of founder of a couple of companies or co-founder. Yeah, that's right. My background originally when I was a youngster was advertising marketing, that's what I did in college. And then, uh, yeah, I spent a decade playing poker for a living, uh, much to my mother's dismay. Um And then after that, uh, I just had a young family and a few other reasons such as, you know, poker becoming illegal in the States, online poker becoming illegal essentially in the States, made me reconsider my career path. And I joined a friend of mine's startup, uh, helping him out with the marketing. That was probably 10 years ago at this stage. And so I kind of got into technology startups from there. Yeah, I can see the link immediately. Technology and soap. No. What is the, how did you end up with soap? So, yeah, I I was in a a few different companies and I went from software to hardware. I was was CEO of a company called Mukul. We used to make, or they still are making, uh, wearable technology for cows. We know, and many people know of Mukul. That is a very successful company. Yeah, brilliant brilliant business. So I was there, essentially their first employee. Um, So I grew that for three years and then I left there to do some stuff on my own and I got involved in more and more e-commerce stuff. Uh, with various degrees of success. And uh, when COVID hit, I uh, was kind of in the process of maybe winding down another business that it wasn't as successful as I would have hoped. And I was kind of clearing out my office and I came across uh, a notebook that I had written written in previously. And there was a list of kind of 10 or 20 products that I thought were ideal for selling online e-commerce products. And kind of soap was one of them, soap for men. And I remember that I'd spent, you know, a fair amount of time researching into it in the past. And I started looking at it again and I thought, gosh, and the reasons it was at the top of the list are, you know, it's small, it's easy to ship, it's consumable, so you use it, you buy more. It, there's lots of variations, you know, lots of different scents, and it also leads on to lots of complementary products. So, for example, we sell deodorant as well. But that's infinite, right? And the market is huge. So there were lots of reasons why it was a a good potential product. And so I started uh, researching again, as I sometimes am prone to do. And I had to just stop myself and say, no, no, you're going to end the same rabbit hole again of overthinking. Why don't you just, you know, Google it, find some factories that make soap and order some samples and and start actually taking action. And uh, credit to Emmett Savage of Mukul, who's the COO or CEO of Mukul. He taught me in my career that, you know, taking action now immediately is a really great thing. Um, so I definitely learned that from him. So I decided, you know, well, let's do it. So I started trying to find factories because I never thought in a million years that I would make it myself, right? That was never part of my idea. You know, I'm not a maker, I'm not a crafty type person. Um, so I contacted a few different factories and arranged samples, but of course, COVID, nothing was happening. Now, I'm also the type of person who, when they get into something, they go 110%. You know, I'm, I don't do things by halves. So while I was waiting on this, I started kind of doing my research, started Googling uh, and watching YouTube videos. And I kind of saw, came across these kind of series of videos teaching people how to make soap. And I thought, oh, well, actually, what better way to, you know, learn about the product than actually try and make it. So I bought a whole load of supplies on Amazon and they arrived, you know, two days later and I started making soap in my kitchen. <laughs> 
But that is the beginning of the future Unilever. <laughs> well, that? maybe. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> but come on, it's not that easy. There are, as you correctly say, and rightly say, a million makers of soaps out there. Surely you just said you're just another one. What, like you did have this e-commerce background. And what did you learn? Some different way of selling? How were you going to crack the market? Anybody listening wants to know how to crack a market. Yeah, so my thought process initially was, well, you know what? Let's just go back a step. By the time the samples finally arrived from the factories in Turkey and wherever wherever else uh, uh, I'd ordered from, the soap that I'd been making myself in my house, and by the way, when I say making, I was literally making it all day, every day. You know, my wife thought I'd gone mad. Like, why am I making all this soap? What am I going to do? I think the word is madder. Yeah, madder, <laughs> definitely, yeah. <laughs> uh, so when it arrived, the stuff I'd been making was as good, and I just decided to go all in and make it myself, right? But I'd been thinking about the brand and, you know, how to how to sell. And initially I thought, well, maybe we can do an Irish thing with it, right? So we can position it as an Irish product and, you know what, we'll sell it in America. That way, you know, if it doesn't work, nobody knows me, that's fine. A little bit less embarrassment. <laughs> uh, and sure, you know what, they might, you know, the Irish-American diaspora is so big, 30 million people in the States or more. Um, so I thought, yeah, let's try that. So that was the original plan. And Throughout my, let's call it two months or three months of learning and experimenting, I found out at one point that you could make soap from anything. You could make it from beer, you could make it from wine, you can make it from any kind of liquid you can be used in, you can make it from milk. And I thought, oh gosh, I wonder could you make it from Guinness? And I started trying to experiment with Guinness. Well, why Guinness? And why did you, why did that come to your head? Is it because of that Irish diaspora thing? Or? Yeah, and probably the amount of Guinness we were consuming on the street at the time in COVID. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> a little bit of a combination. But yeah, it was kind of the Irish thing. I thought, well, if we can make it from Irish ingredients like Guinness, maybe that'll help us position it. And when I actually, and I made multiple versions, obviously, but uh, it was that soap, and it's called Black Stout in, in our line, that actually was the linchpin in me actually committing to this. It was the one time where I showered with it and I thought, gosh, this is actually amazing. I love it. Um, and I'd never had that thought before that maybe I could make it myself. I'm smelling it. It actually smells lovely. Yeah, to be it's fair. very nice. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of a black pepper and cedar wood and fur and clove. Definitely it's, male. It's, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the one thing which I w was absolutely intrigued by when I first met with you, which is only a few days ago, is that Guinness has no hand actor part in this, yet you own the blackstuff.com name. That day in the shower, I was like, oh gosh, I came up with the idea. I thought, maybe, I wonder, could you call it the black stuff? And, you know, jumped out of the shower, ran down to the computer, started doing my research. And, you know, it turned out that my hunch was correct that Guinness actually never used the term the black stuff. It's actually only ever been a colloquialism. I think they used it once in an ad, right? The home of the black stuff, I think they say. But they never actually protected it. It's not a trademarked word or sentence. So I thought, well, let's go for it. And so now I own the trademark. That is brilliant. Yeah. Because as you probably know, Lord Guinness once upon a time was either the richest man in the world. He certainly was the richest man in uh, Europe. So maybe you're heading that direction now. Well, I have a long way to go. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what was next? Oh, so you find out that you can become the black stuff. And then the problem still remains. There is, there are soap vendors, soap, soap makers. You, you said it yourself, making soap is not that difficult. I think yeah, that's what you said anyway. Yeah. So uh, how do you crack it? How do you sell it? How, what, what are you doing to get, you've told me now that you have five people working for you. They have to be paid for, so you're doing something. Yeah, I mean, we're doing brilliant. You know, uh, like I couldn't imagine us being where we're at today, two years ago when I started in my house. So initially I started just making this in my kitchen and I thought, you know, I found a 3PL, which is a third party warehouse partner in the States who would deal with me. And I came up with six different scents originally and I got my packaging made and, and my soap made and initially I had a hundred of each, a hundred bars of soap of each and I shipped it off to the States and yeah, you're right, though, where do you go from there, right? So, you know, I'm pretty good at uh, setting up websites and stuff like that from all the other e-commerce stuff I've done. So I created a website and then just straight away started trying to advertise in the US. And I'd say the first day I started my ad campaign, I'm looking in hindsight, my ads are terrible. They're way better now. But this guy contacted me and he said, oh, I'm coming to Ireland, actually. You know, can I collect from you? And I thought, gosh, that sounds good. Uh, and I said, yeah, no problem. And uh, a week later, he turned up and I met him in town. I bought him a pint and he bought a whole load of soap for me, right? And when he went back to the States, it turns out that he was like a soap enthusiast. He was in all these Facebook groups with... I love these guys. Yeah, with thousands of other soap connoisseurs, let's say, which I had no idea existed. And he invited me to join them. 
And that was kind of what kick-started it. All of a sudden, he posted photos of the soap and goes, I bought this in Ireland, it's available in America. And they were mainly American in the group. And then they all started buying it to try it out. And uh, the feedback from them was incredible, which I did not believe possible because, you know, I was just making this myself. But, you know, they were saying, this is the best soap I've ever tried. It's amazing, you got to try it. it. smells so natural, so on and so forth. That one chance encounter, me buying him a pint in uh, Temple Bar, and he went back with a whole load of soap for his American friends in the group. I did, wasn't a member at the time, but, you know, he had posted, I'm buying this soap, does so anyone want some? And so he brought a whole, back a whole load of it and shipped it to his friends. And that was kind of, I guess, the push start that I needed just to get the ball rolling a little bit. And, you know, it got me my first hundred customers, and then it kind of just grew from there. But it still is a problem that there are a thousand, a million I don't know how many how many soaps are there in the world. I mean, Lots. infinite. Exactly. Yeah. You're still out there. You've got your brand. Cool. Very yeah. cool. You've got a nice smell. But if you're trying to really grow, you're into the, I was going to use a, 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 a wrong name there, but you're into a niche market there. You must have a much bigger market than that now. And how are you getting that? How are you getting them? Yeah, so... I spent the first six months just selling in the States, you know, with no confidence. And then as I started to get more and more feedback from these people and other customers, you know, we were, our ads were starting to work. We were getting, you know, reviews from the existing customers and so on. I kind of grew confidence in the product. We expanded the line. We added more soaps. In the background, I was working on a natural deodorant and that took, you know, the guts of a year to perfect. And then I decided I'm just going to try and launch this in Ireland as well. And initially when I was selling it, it was like, you know, trying to play on the Irishness, right? And I thought, well, that's not going to fly here because nobody's going to buy it because, you know, we use Irish rainwater in our Irish mountain rain soap. You know, that's kind of a little bit inconsequential. So uh, I just focused on the pure qualities of the product. Um, But one thing I did do different was I decided at the start that I was going to document my journey. So I started recording videos of myself making the product on TikTok and Facebook and Instagram and all that type of stuff. So I've done that from the get-go, from the, literally from before I launched, I've been recording videos of myself. There's even a video of me going, I, I think I'm going to make soap, you know, and this is why I'm choosing soap. So there's an authenticity to the brand that you don't see with other brands potentially. And, you know, there's a lot of affinity of my customers towards me as a person because they see me interacting and sometimes I live stream us making soap and we do all sorts of things like that that helps build up that kind of uh, relationship between customer and brand. One of the reasons that you go into business is uh, to, well, the obvious reason is to make some money. But one of the things that they tell you to do is to make sure that there is a big barrier to entry. I'm holding your soap now. That must be the lowest barrier of entry item ever. I mean, it's a soap. Why did you choose something so easy? I mean, you said you had a 20, 30, 40, 60 other items that you could have chosen and that might have been more difficult to, to replicate. You'd be surprised. You know, it's there's low barrier to entry for a factory made soap. I would say there's a very high barrier to entry making handmade soap at scale, which is what we're now doing. We're, How much is a bar of that? We're selling that for six ninety five or seven ninety five, depending on the soap. Okay, so that's a kind of a gift to dad type of soap. That's not your Lidl Aldi or Tesco. No, definitely not. Yeah. No. Okay. And common feedback we get from people before they become customers is, why would I spend seven euro on a bar of soap I can buy for a euro in Aldi? Mm-hmm. And the response is, well, if you want the soap from Aldi, buy it. But yeah. if you want high quality, completely natural, handmade product, then you'd have to pay for it. Yeah, so it's challenging to, I believe, to replicate the business model. But there's a few different things at work, right? One is our recipe. You know, that's... The, the secret sauce. The secret sauce. You know, uh, that's Who obviously... Who knows that? Well, me and my employees. Uh, that's oh, it. the employees do. So well, you have to yeah. shoot them or something. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You get them to sign NDAs and all that stuff. But uh, yeah, so the recipes are unique to us. Now, the essential oil mixes, which is what we use to create the scents, are all invented by me. Because not only did I decide I was going to make scent, I also or make soap, I also decided I was going to invent all the scents and started buying essential oils and blending them, mixing them, trying to come up with my own scent profiles because I'm a little bit crazy. But in terms of barrier to entry, this year we'll probably make somewhere around half a million bars of soap. Get away. Handmade. Did you just see my jaw drop? 54 soaps at a time. Yeah. So I would challenge your perception. That's changed my perception completely. Yeah. I had no idea that it was that big now. Yeah. That is fabulous. Yeah. So we better mention Parcel Planet because they are part of the the process now. Uh, That's how I met with you. 
is through Parcel Planet Mark Green uh, because they do your fulfillment now. Why? Yeah, so we started out outsourcing our fulfillment in the States, right? And that was great to begin with. And then we ended up having a terrible problem with them and ended up switching to someone else. In Ireland, when I launched, and Ireland took off, is way bigger than the US market for us at the moment, right? Ireland really? actually, when it took off, took off way, like the acceleration was way quicker. And what's the demographic? <clears throat> Young men or? People like me. <laughs> I'm yeah. in my mid 40s. Because I'm in all my ads, I tend to attract similar people, I guess. So yeah, most of my customers are men in their mid 30s and up. This is a very clean nation based on a half a million parts of soap. Yeah, so we were initially in the States, we were still outsourcing our fulfillment. In, at home, we were doing it ourselves. And it was just, they were our only two markets. And in the last kind of six months, I realized if we're going to scale, part of what we were holding us back was us, like literally all day. You would see, you'd need to see the amount of bags of stuff we were bringing down to the post office. You know, it was a two-man job every day, all day, putting soap into boxes and putting labels and writing uh, handwritten notes for customers and all that type of stuff. And oh, sorry, just, don't, don't, don't gloss over the handwritten note because that is important as well. That is part of the shtick is that you actually talk to your customers directly. Once like upon that. a time, yeah. yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I, I just can't do that anymore, you know, um, but I was at the beginning. Um, now you I used to write them little notes and sign it. Yeah, and I would, if you bought from me, uh, you know, in the first, certainly the first year, year and a half, uh, when you bought the second time, I may well recognize your name, um, you know, uh, and if you bought me three or four times, I definitely would have recognized your name and written you a thank you or whatever. Now, we've scaled past that now. Unfortunately, it's not conceivable. But we needed to uh, find a partner. And initially, how I came across Parcel Planet was I was looking at the UK market. So we never shipped into the UK because it was total pain with Brexit. And, you know, going to the post office, not only was it incredibly expensive to post them here, but, it, you know, time consuming. It would take an hour in the post office to post 10 items to the, to the UK. It was crazy. So... I came across Parcel Planet with that in mind. So we started with them in their warehouse in Birmingham a month ago, maybe five weeks. And now, today, the UK is our largest in terms of every sales every day. We're selling more in the UK than anywhere else in the world. And how are you managing to get those sales? Again, TikTok and the rest. Yeah, and online advertising. And do they have that? Um, yeah. Again, I won't use any rude words, but is that niche audience? Do, uh, do they have one of those over there as well? No, absolutely not. Uh, and we haven't kind of marketed to, you know, soap connoisseurs since the very beginning. Yeah. Uh, we very much, you know, our customers are anywhere from, you know, some, a hardworking man who is a mechanic all the way up to, you know, a guy wearing a suit who works at a desk. It's, it's mind, all right. sorts of you'll take, you'll take their money. Yeah. I have to start asking about the black stuff, though. Is that Guinness has never come after you about this? No, and thankfully, <laughs> <laughs> touch wood. No, I, I mean, it's incredible yeah. that you've, really have scored there. Yeah, I think it's a great brand Everybody name. Everybody in Ireland knows yeah. the black stuff. And uh, yeah, uh, fantastic. So what's the future? Uh, I don't want to rush into the future because it's such a brilliant story. Now you've started Underarm Deodorant, is that what you said? Yeah, so it took me about a year, I'd say 18 months ago, we launched our deodorant and that's been brilliant. Uh, is that a stick deodorant or a spray? Yeah, it's a, it's stick. a stick deodorant. It's 100% natural, made from wax and oils and essential oils. And we use uh, magnesium as our active ingredient. So that's milk of magnesia. So the way our deodorant works is we fight the root cause of BO, which is your sweat doesn't actually smell. It's uh, the bacteria that thrive in a sweaty environment that stink. So what we do is we create a very slightly alkali environment in your armpit, which makes it impossible for bacteria to survive. And therefore, he smells fresh all day long. And three or four years ago, you would never have known any of the above, would no, you? I love no, that. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. And what other, your, the, the, overall, the overarching brand name is the Black Stuff. But you're going to go, I'm looking at Dogs Bay Beach. I know where Dogs Bay is. Yeah, and that soap is inspired by that. I was there with my family two years ago. We were sitting on it. It was a yeah, heat wave. And I thought, gosh, this is a, a great spot. Maybe we could create a product around this. Will you ship yeah. out of here all of the time? I mean, again, it comes back to uh, commercial realities. You could or you might have to go abroad and make it there. So my goal is to always manufacture in Ireland. I should explain export. where you're making it as well. You started off, if anybody knows Dublin, the bottom of Buddhiston Avenue must be some of the most expensive real estate in the country to be making soap, I can tell you. But you've just moved into Sandyford Industrial Estate. Is that what you're talking Yeah. Yeah, we're moving in uh, this weekend. So, yeah. And tell, congratulations. Thanks very much. Yeah, I yeah. started in my house. For the first year, it was just me making soap all day, every day. So your wife loved that. Yeah, and the house, <laughs> it started being tidy and, you know, I could keep it to my office and then it started to over over 
overwhelm the house. And then eventually I just, I had to move out, thankfully. And I managed to get a one-year lease uh, up in um, well, in Black Rock I wanted to stay close to home. And I hired uh, an old friend and we grew from there. So the future, what is the plan? So the plan is to continue growing. Uh, I need to because it's an expensive lease I've just signed. Um, but <laughs> I'm confident. Kids are growing. Yeah, I'm confident we will. I alluded to us hopefully making about half a million bars so in the next 12 months, and I'm confident we will. Um, and we may even exceed those uh, targets. So the, the goal for the future is to just build a brand that lasts last the test of time. You know, I'm not trying to build something to make a quick book or to flip it or to sell somebody else. I've never raised any money for this business. I've self-funded the entire thing. It's been profitable since day one, albeit we reinvest all our profits into, you know, stock and growth. But the plan here is just to create a business that, you know, hires people and employs people and, uh, yeah, puts great products out into the world. I think it's fantastic. You do know that we are connected with the Connecticut Business uh, grouping in the Ireland Connecticut Business Council. And there's a guy there from County Youth called Tony Sheridan, and he is just about to open his new exhibition centre and he's looking for products from Ireland to stick in there. So I'm yeah, going to connect you with Tony Sheridan and you can have your black stuff sitting there and you'll have black stuff in there before another beer of the same name or something. Uh, that's, <laughs> well, yeah, would that's be funny. cool? Yeah, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, thanks very much. And world domination, cool. You do have to answer one final question for us is, well, what would you, John Larkin, who would you hire in a heartbeat? Great question. And uh, I thought long and hard about this one. Good. You give me a little bit of a heads up that it was coming. And I decided... We tried to do that, but people don't tend to read the email, yeah, which was yeah. <laughs> frustrating. And so, you know, I decided that the person I would hire in a heartbeat is uh, one of my heroes, uh, similar age to myself, is Mr. Brian O'Driscoll. Okay, right? he'd be a good start, all yeah, right, yeah. He has incredibly fast hands, so I figure oh, he would be very quite good. the dab at stirring and mixing a bowl of soap. <laughs> so if if all else failed, he could become a great soap maker. But it'd be more for his in into the IRFU and Leinster Rugby, who I would love to see maybe just using my product to begin with. <laughs> Well, we'll see if we can make a connection into the IRFU. I know one or two people there, including the co-founder of this podcast is a, a young man called Jamie Heaslip. Jamie, he never smelt, so he always smelt very well. So maybe he's, he's very dapper. Very, yeah. very dapper. That's a nice term yeah. for him. And, and I think he's kind of fond of that, or that look and that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I know Jamie, and I will pass uh, some soap on to Jamie oh, for that'd you. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. Take it from there. Thanks very much. That is wonderful. That's a great story. Please come back to us and tell us how you get on. And uh, another shout out, of course, to Parcel Planet and Mark Green for introducing me to you. And we'll hear more about the great Black Stuff journey in the future. Thanks so much for joining us on That Great Business Show. Dundeal Motors is home to Ireland's largest range of new and premium used cars. That's why you'll find cars from Audi and BMW dealerships on Dundeal. Are you looking for a seven-seater to accommodate your growing family? Maybe you're after a luxury saloon to make a statement. We have the car for you. You'll also find Ireland's largest range of electric cars to help you make the switch. Visit dundeal.ie today to start the search for your next car. De facto shaving oil. The world's best shaving oil. Made in Mayo. Sold worldwide. All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. This interview was first posted on episode 142 of That Great Business Show. Essential listening for anyone looking for pivot inspiration. For more great business insights, do listen back to our entire back catalogue of the 